It's pretty good, huh? It was really cool. Hey, guys. Hey. Okay, I'm sitting down. So, yeah. Get comfortable. Yes. So, uh, so this cool. is Greg Jones. Hi, guys. Hey. What's going on? So, we're just going to have a conversation. Okay. I'm going to ask you a few questions and you, you just go, yeah. go nuts. Yeah. Um, so, I want to start with you getting, you were in Cincinnati? That's where I'm from, yeah, born yep. and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. And you got a scholarship at the, the number one football program in the state of Michigan? We were going to say that, yeah, go yep. green, Michigan yep. State, baby. That's right, baby. <laughs> we're going to do it. I'm going to go for it, guys. <laughs> so, tell us about that. So, you're obviously doing really well in high school football. Yeah. But you get a call to a program, it's out of state, it's yeah. a big, big program. Yeah, so, um, you know, originally trying to go to Michigan State or really play college football, uh, I, I really, I got to a point where I needed to start to make um, a plan. You know, originally with a dream, uh, I told my mom that I wanted to do, you know, and really uh, she's, all, she's been against me at, at this point in time because she thought I was too small and I would get hurt. Uh, when I first started playing football at age eight years old. You are pretty small. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay fit. You know, I've been trying <laughs> to work out, man, okay. Um, <laughs> and, and so she told me, she was like, well, son, you got three options. Um, at this point in time in high school, she said that uh, you could take out a loan uh, and start, you know, walk on somewhere. Uh, you could switch sports. I was pretty decent at basketball at the time and go full-time basketball at the community college or earn a scholarship. And I said, I think I can earn a scholarship, you know? And the sacrifice that went into that was just so monumental. I remember um, having to pick up a job. Uh, my father, uh, who's still now a bartender waiter, uh, would get up in the morning, drop me off so I can work in the kitchen um, at my high school. Uh, cleaning dishes where I started with that. And so, uh, you know, and that's, that's not easy to do, you know, um, when you don't have the means and you're trying to pursue your dream, uh, now a goal at this point in time, it was not easy to do. I got laughed at by my own teammates, laughed at by kids and I didn't even know in the high school. Uh, and it was tough, you know, because they couldn't see my vision. They couldn't see my dream. Uh, and every time they laughed at me, I would say, it's okay, I'm gonna have to laugh, laugh eventually, you know, and so, and I did, you know, and uh, Coach D uh, walked in at the time, he's with the University of Cincinnati, and I turned him down because I just got offered by Minnesota, and then after that, uh, Minnesota lost in their bowl game, the guy at Michigan State, John L. at the time, just got released, and I ended up here at Michigan State. Um, playing football, so I'm proud to be here, and I live here full time now, Michigan. I love it, love it, guys. Yeah, yeah. So, so they were laughing at you because you're, you're cleaning dishes at the high school you're going to. They, that must have been tough. It was so tough uh, because you almost feel like, man, like they can't see what I'm working on. They have no idea why I'm working here. They don't know if I need it just because to live or to get, buy some extra things or try to get a new cell phone at the time. Uh, they had no idea that this was to pursue my dream. Um, and the money didn't like go in my pocket. It literally went right into my training and that's what I had to do. Because, you know, eventually you have to learn to separate yourself from anything you're trying to do. You know, when, it's the, when the goal means that much to you, the dream is that important, uh, you have to do what it takes to separate yourself to get noticed. Um, and then not only at the same time, but stay at the level uh, where you can be dominant as well too, especially in football. That's not a common thing for high schoolers to have that drive. Where, do you know, have a sense where that came from? I, I, it came from wanting to change my circumstance. Uh, I, was, I grew up in Section 8 housing in Cincinnati. Uh, my parents, like I said, both worked a couple of different jobs. And I'm the only child just to support me uh, in our household. So uh, I always knew that there was a, a way I can better change my circumstance. And for me, it was through football. And uh, for anybody out there, like it's not just through sport, you can do it through anything. But for me, uh, it, it was football was my vehicle to, to change my circumstance. And um, it hasn't for my life. And you know, I'm here now and, and you know, I'm very gracious you know, to have the opportunity to do so. But that's where the drive started that though. From my parents being in that situation, I knew I had to get out. I knew that I wanted something better um, for myself as well too. 
So you go to state mm -hmm. as a true freshman. You lead the team in tackles. Yeah, yeah. How did that? Did did you start getting pushed into leadership roles then with that kind of performance? So what? Yeah. How did that? As a true freshman, that's again yes. not usual. It's not usual. So first off, when you're a true freshman at Michigan State University, um, really in academics or anything else. You are just a freshman. You get lost and you have no idea where you're going and so like how to f get your way back to practice. So a couple of guys, spots who I took, they were, <laughs> those were the guys that were giving me rides, you know, around campus and things. And so it, it became tough, you know, conversations became tough. But the, the lesson I think the leadership for me started to happen uh, because I started playing more, uh, started having a little bit of a voice. Uh, but I was still listening to the people um, in front of me, the, the senior captains there, there, there in front of me who are still um, guys I lean on till today uh, for, for leadership and, and questions that I may have. But yeah, without a doubt, that's where it started from. And it's not easy to do. You know, a lot of guys ask me, you know, how to make an impact. And it's the same thing. It's the same sacrifice uh, that you have to apply uh, at that level. And it, it really becomes greater because now you have to juggle everything in school. And school is a lot harder now. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was very, very tough to do so, but it was a good start. And so it's not, <clears throat> you, you, you kind of have to stand out within that group as well. Mm -hmm. So you're standing out in the high school, mm -hmm. which is one thing. Yes. Then of all the people that made it to the state football team, you got to stand out amongst them as well. Yes. How, and, uh, how were you keeping that drive going? Because there's a lot of distractions at Michigan State. I keep that drive going and really everything I do by remembering where I started. Um, one of the quotes I love a lot was on the side of our linebacker room, uh, at this time in New York Giants, but it, it'll make sense. It, it's, if it doesn't come from you, where will it come from? And that's what the, the mantra I took, even at that time, um, I couldn't put it into words, but that put it into words. I knew what I wanted to do well before I got to Michigan State. Um, it, so it really didn't matter who was there. It really didn't matter the competition. I knew I was going to prepare um, and get ready to go. And I treated everything like it was a game day. And when I talk to the kids a lot who want to make that same type of impact early on, I tell them that, like, you got to treat it like a game. Uh, and, and so that's how you start to take yourself to the next level. And it makes the game even easier. It becomes almost like a deja vu at that certain, at that certain point in time. Some people call it like that flow theory, stay in that state of flow. That that's how you get there. Brilliant. So you started, uh, you led tackles every year, I think, right? Four years in a row. Yeah. So yeah. you're pretty good. I'm pretty good. Yeah. I'm pretty good. Yeah, I'm pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so you, uh, you, you started getting captaincy roles towards the end as well. So yes. were you, who, who were some of the people that you looked at as mentors, whether that's in coaching staff or, yes. or playing staff? What, or, what, who were some of those people stand out, and what are the messages that you maybe learned there? You already had this drive, right. but were, some, were there some things you learned at State that... Wow, uh, man. I want to say my freshman year was Caleb Thornhill uh, and Travis Key. Uh, those two guys are still now leaders in my life now, uh, but Travis uh, was more on the side like Greg, like football won't last forever. You need to prepare. You need to make sure you're going to class, and not only going to class, but introducing yourself to the professors. So that was, Ke that was Travis, excuse me, on, the, on that side. Caleb on the side of football was just like, if you really want this, you're going to have to really work for it. And so don't be scared to stay in the weight room longer, and don't be scared to outrun guys. He's, he was the guy always pushing me. And, um, and still, like I said today, when we talk and stuff, he's always trying to say, hey, what are you working on? What are you doing? What are you getting better at? And, and those two guys, I would say, definitely had um, a lot of impact on my life. Uh, Coach D, uh, without a doubt, you know, believing in me. When I got to Michigan State, uh, even after all the training I did um, that I talked about, I was still 190 pounds or so uh, defensive end, getting ready to try to go play linebacker, you know. And so to most people, you know, they don't want to take a guy like that to play linebacker in the Big Ten, but uh, was able to mold me into the person I am today and the person I became on the football field. And so were there some specific things that those two did? Because there's people in the room in mentoring positions, <clears throat> whether that's... Uh, people at the one end of the age scale, or mm -hmm. these guys over here are, mm -hmm. are going to be in positions within their school mm -hmm. to mentor others. Were there some things that those two did that separated them, other than the specific advice they gave, but 
How, it, how did they behave in that role? It was walking the walk and talking the talk, you know, and, and really I would watch them do things. And that's where, and I'm like, okay, they're actually not only telling me what to do, but they're the ones that are doing it. And they're not only just doing it for that week or that month, but it's been consistent year in and year out. Uh, I, I think that if, if when you're in that role, people have to see you first, you know? And now me, I have three kids now, and I'm always reminded by my parents and stuff, you know, kids will always do what they see us do, not what we tell them, you know, no matter how loud we scream. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so it's just, it's one of those things that if you're in that role, especially with the youth, um, they have to see you do those things and, do, and stay consistent on it. Um, they see you fall off, they're gonna think they can fall off or they think it's, or it's good enough is good enough. And that's not the case, it has to be consistent. Yeah. And presumably that's how you led when you were the captain there? I did whatever I could, you know. I, I remember uh, picking up guys, I, I had a van um, that I used all my little scholarship money and I bought a van and I picked up guys um, to make it to practice, to make it to extra workout because I got tired of the excuse so I can't make it and I don't have a ride and I'm too lazy, basically what they were trying to say. But uh, I figured, okay, let me just, I'll bring the mountain to you and I put them in there and I picked them up and um, I almost got in trouble for having a legal taxi but it wasn't <laughs> the case, all right? Because um, they didn't have money, so they didn't pay me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, but it was cool because they got to see that and then that is passing the baton and they were like, okay, this is what you have to do to be a leader. And you have to stay consistent in that once again. So let's move forward then. You get drafted by the Giants. Yeah. Um, you become a starter in that first year. Yes. How, that, because that, another thing that doesn't happen very often, yes. certainly didn't happen for me. Yeah. When you, so <laughs> yeah. how did you, um, how, how did that happen and, and what did you do to adapt to that? Because you, I, you were probably hoping for it and planning for it, but you wouldn't right. have expected to be starting that first year. No, especially, uh, I was a six rounder, right. you know, and you know, a lot of six round guys normally get cut, uh, don't stick around long and to, you know, I was with the twos and then making it to the twos and I beat a couple guys out and I get a call um, that when I started linebacker, uh, bumped his knee with another guy and tore his ACL. Uh, and they were like, listen, we're not going after anybody else. We believe in you and we want you to come in early, early tomorrow morning um, to get the playbook and everything. We're kind of taking things up to another level. And so uh, it was a lot, you know, I was very, very nervous. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Um, all the games I've played, but um, I ended up coming out pretty good. Had about four or five tackles. Um, we lost that game against the Redskins, but it was one of the best moments of my life. And uh, I was one of the first uh, rookie linebackers to start um, since Lawrence Taylor, and, I, and it was a cool honor. He was decent. I, yeah, he was decent, and so, you know, to, to kind of trail in those footsteps, um, especially my dad grew up watching Lawrence Taylor, and that's really how I got into football, through my dad watching a lot of football as well. It, it was just amazing, and to prepare for that was another level that, now at this point in time, there's no school, so it's all day, everything, that's all you do, it's your job, it's how you feed your family um, and put a roof over your head and, and exactly what it was. And so I made it that and I gave it my all like I did every year. And then uh, more unexpected stuff, you, at the end of the season, you get engaged and then the yep. Super Bowl interrupts mm -hmm. your engagement proposal. Yeah, I don't, and, yeah, I don't know why they did that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> The engagement was pretty cool. Uh, you know, even though my wife, she was the one on the social media, like TMZ and all that stuff, and then <laughs> she didn't have anything to say and made me talk. Uh, but, you know, honestly, it was a moment where I was like, this, I can have some fun here. I really didn't think it was gonna be a big deal, to be honest with you. I thought everybody was into the Super Bowl, into uh, Eli Manning, and he just got his big award. But, no, I really didn't think it was gonna be a big deal and end up being, on ESPN and all these front page, all these newspapers and all these different outlets. But yeah, it, it was a really cool experience and that's one of the best days, you know, in our lives as a family now too, yeah. 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 And if you didn't know, he proposed I after, proposed after to my winning wife, the Super Bowl? Yes, after, after we won. Uh, and to answer, answer everybody's question, yes, I would have proposed even if we <laughs> lost, okay? Uh, we had another vacation plan and so I was like, I'm, I'm, but, but somehow she found out and I was like, okay, I'm a getter. 
And then she started crying when I asked. I'm like, okay, maybe I shouldn't have did this. <laughs> and because it was like uncontrollable. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, yeah, and so she said yes, and now we have three kids. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> so, again, you don't expect to win the Super Bowl in your first season? No. Generally? No. How did you, I mean, what, how did you deal with that? It was, uh, well, the game, I want to say really leading up to it, uh, we went through a four-game losing streak. And there were just times where I was like, okay, my season might be over here. I need to try to make sure I stay dominant, make sure I stay relevant, uh, continue to work hard, and make sure I can you know, try to eventually get a new contract at the, end of my, at the end of my deal. And then we started winning games. And I'm like, okay, this is like, this could really happen. And then we go to San Fran. Uh, and we beat, you know, the 49ers, and it was just, I was like, wow, like, we're really here. And to get to the game, all I was thinking, because I was on kickoff return at this point in time, all I'm thinking is, like, just don't fall. Like, just <laughs> don't, don't be that guy to fall. Uh, but but the, the game is a dream come true from an eight-year-old boy uh, from the inner city of Cincinnati to um, holding a, a Super Bowl trophy and getting a ring and having my name uh, etched in the Lombardi trophy for a lifetime um, that my kids' kids will be able to see one day is, is truly amazing. That's all I ever wanted um, was just to be remembered and to change my circumstance. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. Thank you. So, interestingly, after that, you get waived the next year, right? Yeah. You yeah. didn't get that contract. No, I didn't. I didn't. So, that's got to be hard. You, yes. win the, you get to, I mean, you've been dreaming about this since you yes. were a kid. Yes. You do, in the first season, you achieved what you were looking for in a whole career. Yes. And then, Kapow. how do you deal with, with yeah. that down after that huge high? It was really, really tough. And, uh, and it's a true story. I told Joe this backstage, but like, we were really watching Impractical Jokers at the same time, and it was keeping me in a good mood, you know? And so, uh, it was so to meet Joe right there was uh, today was awesome as well too yeah so it was it was so cool I'm serious I'm serious because you know to that day that I got cut I had never been told no I always been the guy right and then they're like well we think we have three other guys better than you right even though I, I disagree <laughs> um, but you know and and it was really tough but how did I deal with that. I stayed extremely positive. I was honest with myself on what I did wrong. Um, I still built upon the things, everything I did right. Uh, and I had a really good circle around me, you know, because when you get drafted, and like I said, I'm a six round draft pick, so I didn't go to New York and do the whole big deal. Uh, you have people that you've never met before, all of a sudden are like, listen, like, man, congratulations. I'm like, how did you even find my house? You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, to go from that to being released, and then there's nobody around, right? It was me, um, my wife, my mom and dad, her mom and dad, uh, and at this point in time, we had a small dog named Rico who was a rescue. Um, Joe, I had a, yeah, no, Joe liked that. Well, I know mm -hmm. Joe liked that. Uh, and so uh, we got from the, in Jersey too, Joe. Uh, so it was, that was it. You know, that's all we had, and it was tough, but I remember just saying, staying positive. I kept working out. I never stayed down on myself, and things worked out, and I got picked up by Jacksonville um, after doing two weeks in the UFL with the Las Vegas Locomotives. Um, go Locos. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously. And, that was, and that, was a, that was a strange time as well, too, because I got picked up um, by Jacksonville from those two games in the UFL. And I'm not joking, there was one lady in the stands with a cane who was banging her cane against the rail and saying, go Locos, the whole game. And I didn't even start. I was a backup. I came in in the second half, I had 10 tackles. And I asked the coach when I got to Jacksonville, I said, how? He was like, that game. He said, I've never seen anything like that before. But I was so positive to that point that this was going to work out. And yeah, I got another year with the Jacksonville Jaguars, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And so, I mean, then you had a, a number of years of struggles with injuries, mm -hmm. waivers again. Yeah. You kept going, mm -hmm. you kept going. Mm -hmm. um, did that team start building up around you again? Not, uh, not that the first 
massive group of people right. in your team, but right. you start having a team around you that helps you get through that stuff other than family? Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, there's a guy, um, and I hope he, I hope he watches this. Uh, his name is Brandon Denson. Um, and he was the guy that actually got me to be where I am right now, talking to people. I was never, ever like that until he started pushing me to talk to people and things like that in college. Um, he ended up being the godfather um, of my son. And, and Brandon, I, I say that the outside circle, he came and got me when I broke my leg because I had to get surgery and everything and I couldn't drive back because of my right leg. And yeah, from Michigan, he came, got me, drove me all the way back home. And uh, we still stay in touch today. Uh, he does great work with the Juvenile, or JDRF, Juvenile Diabetes Research uh, Foundation. Uh, shout, out, shout out to Brandon, give a shout out. Um, but, but honestly, he was one of the guys, I was like, he, ride or die, he's gonna be there for me no matter what. And then I'm so happy that, that he was there for me. But yeah, that was it though. You know, that, that small group of guys, that's all I had with me, yeah. So all through this, from, from being successful in high school football mm -hmm. to going to college, to being a pro with all the, the hangers on and mm. the agents and the people that want, want everything from you. Mm. How did you keep avoiding, and I'm sure you had some where you didn't, but how do you avoid all those, inf those bad influences that are, are there dragging at you, pulling at you all the time that, that people have? My goals were much, much greater than those influences. Much, much greater. Uh, it was always a loss, no matter what, no matter how you cut it. Uh, and, and you do, you get pulled by a lot. Um, everybody wants something from you. Everybody just wants to figure out an angle to, to get something out of you. And uh, going through the process of being cut, you realize that's your circle and those people, what you're doing right now, that's all you need. So for somebody to come and give you something that um, is not going to help you and really going to hinder you uh, in, in your process and, and really your drive to your goals and your dreams, I was like, there's no way I'm going to take a downfall here. There's no way I'm going to take a loss here because I have my goals, I have my dreams, I know why I set out to do these things. I'm not going to let anything stop me. So my yeses were much, much greater than those no's. Did you early on write down these goals? How are you keeping them fresh in your, in your mind to keep that, fo that strong focus? Because that's tough. It's very tough, and there's a reevaluation of my goals as well, too. I, after being cut, you know, you know, two or three times, you have to reevaluate re what your goals are, you know, and, and really make a different plan. You know, don't really change your goals so much, but change their plan, and you have to adjust, and that was very, very key for me, because I had to repro reprogram my brain into thinking um, a different way and continually to find the positives um, and, and a lot of negatives because they were there, you know, and um, there's stories of guys that, you know, I played with that had downfalls and really spiraled out and, and couldn't get back up. And so um, staying positive in those negatives was very, very key. And also reevaluate my plan uh, to get my goal to play in the professional ranks of football um, was, was tough, but it was, it was able to be done though, yeah. So you now, speak in front of schools. Yes. How did, was there a conscious decision there to be speaking to kids instead of maybe corporate audiences yes. or why? The why was because I got forced to, to be honest with you guys, I was not, <laughs> I'm serious. I was a very, like I told, I was very much of a um, lead by example and let people, like I said, let people see me. And people just kept forcing me like, okay, you need to share how you did what you did. You just can't, you know, watch videos and things like that because they don't understand the journey, they don't understand the story. And uh, I think the moment, well, there's two moments. Well, the first one uh, was I got asked to go speak in Canada and, at a banquet, and they ended up getting like 2,000 views on Facebook out of nowhere, but once again, I was forced to, by my wife to film it, because I didn't want to film it, <laughs> and she put it up on Facebook, and the, the messages, everybody was just really positive with me about it, and I was like, okay, I think I might be able to do this, and somebody found me, uh, my buddy um, who started Positive You, Kenny Spear, 
uh, he found me and was like, dude, like, let's do this. Like, you, you can do this. There's some things I got to coach you up on. Like, don't look at flashcards <laughs> uh, and stop your hand from shaking. Uh, but, but You're doing great. Yeah, thank you. I know, right? I know. Uh, and, and so it, it was really, really cool, you know, to have that transition. And then the second one was the impact that I could have on the kids and the, and the youth because it really hit me. Um, like our youth is the people that are going to be taking care of us, you know, as we get older. And, and I want those people to be great. And then I started hearing a lot of stories of like the suicide and things like that. It's really a big thing now with, within our youth. And I think there needs to be more people, more positive influences around them going back and being honest with them. I think that's the one thing that really calls me to speak is I'm able to be honest and have a real impact with them. And it's not like I, they can see me. Like I'm, I'm being real with you. If I'm late to somewhere, all my kids know I'm like, Greg is late, you know? And, and I tell them why. And I'm just being human with them and let them be able to see, okay, I can do this too. Even though he, I went through a tough time, he went through a tough time, I can see it and I can get past it. Yeah. Have you got an example of, of someone that you've made an impact Yes, yes. On? So guys, I want to read this to you, okay? I got asked him before. To, to do this, all right? I won't say the guy's name. Uh, so I do a leadership camp uh, at this school, and I do, it's probably the past two, three years I've done a leadership camp here um, at the school, and the kid uh, was like sick this day, and he couldn't make it to the camp, um, but he had been last year, and um, this is what he said. He said, dang dude, I wish I would have known you would be coming back to the high school. Uh, it would have been good to see you. Ever since you came, you have really had a big influence on my football career, entering my senior season, and honestly showing me the power black men can have in America if you've got the right mindset. Thank you. And so, uh, almost put me in tears, because I'm like, dude, like, I just tell you my stories and my life, and meanwhile, I've inspired, inspired this kid to go inspire his team, and he's a leader. He was a captain. He ended up becoming the captain of the team, um, and having some schools look at him as well, too. So, uh, yeah, guys, it was, the impact was amazing. It was awesome. I think you know, too, from, from being around so many athletes, so mm -hmm. many pro athletes, mm -hmm. that, that there's role models and there's, there's not role models. Yes. And, you nice. you got to make that decision, it's and a, you are. Clearly. Yeah, it's an everyday decision, and to be honest with you, um, you just impact more people when you're making the right one, and you know when you're making the right decision, uh, especially at our age. And uh, somebody once said, you know, I think uh, it was Kevin Durant who said, like, these guys, these kids look at us as heroes, and, and truthfully, I mean, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and, it, and it's the honest, honestly God truth that we are. We are heroes in their eyes. We can fly. We can levitate. We can walk on water. Um, and it's important we keep that up because, you know, it's, it's, we want to give somebody a positive somebody to look at, you know, and, and day in, day out, day yeah. in, day out. Yeah. I think it's really important. I think um, a few years ago, I think Charles Barkley said that he had no obligation to be a role model. He was an athlete. That was mm -hmm. his job. That was the end of the mm -hmm. job. And I think that's just uh, maybe being a bit naive because you have got people looking at you all, yes, all the time. All the so time. you've got to make those decisions. Um, we've got to finish up. I want to ask if you've got anything around that drive, around that goal setting, maintaining positiv positivity mm -hmm. um, for the audience because, because these people have been, and you've seen some of the talks this morning, they're being inspired. They're already thinking about what they're going to do when they get out of here mm -hmm. to change the world. That's right. How can they keep that going the way that you did? Keep that front of mind. Wow. Uh, what I would like to say to you uh, to, to keep it going, always remember why you started. If you remember why you started, what you're going to come against the, as far as the negativity, because the second you set out to do an amazing, amazing goal, that's the second that that negativity is going to happen. And it's so important that you remember why you started because that will drive you, that will push you. Uh, and once that starts to happen and it becomes a realization of your hard work and everything that you've sacrificed, it will be so worth it, I promise you. And, you know, and, and like my buddy said, the proof, the rings is my proof that like even despite everything I went through in my career and in my life, having been able to play in the Super Bowl and being able to play football and impact people all over the world, it has been so worth it. So I just ask you, 
all to remember why you started, um, whatever goal that you're trying to set um, to impact people. Just please remember why you started. Greg Jones, ladies Thank you, and gentlemen. guys. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome, dude. Thanks, oh, man. Man, that was good, man. Thank you. Thank you. Get Thank your you. Phone. Yeah. Thank you.